Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday evening worship service here at St. Matthew in Urbana. Once again, we are doing the service called Unfailing Light. Um, we hope that you are blessed by this evening worship time. We will be celebrating Holy Communion, so we invite you to make sure that you have your, your wine or grape juice and your bread or cracker um, ready for it um, that time within the worship service so that you may partake of the Lord's Supper with us. Thank you all for being with us. Let us begin our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed be God, who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and rich in love. God does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor punish us according to our guilt, but looks upon us in compassion, forgives our sin, and heals our lives. Therefore, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy, O God. Against you, you alone, we have sinned. In your compassion, cleanse us from our sin and take away our guilt. Create in us a new heart and give us a steadfast spirit. Do not cast us away, but fill us with your Holy Spirit and restore your joy within us. As tender as parent to child, so gentle is God with you. As high as heaven is above earth, so vast is God's love for you. As far as east is from west, so far God removes your sin from you, renewing your life through Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, source of all goodness and life, who clothes us with Christ Jesus and makes us one by the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. O servants of God, let us sing our praise. We bless your holy name, O God. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we bless your holy name, O God. You lift up the weak and hungry, we bless your holy name, O God, and your glory shines above the heavens. We bless your holy name, O God. <coughs> your canopy of vigil lights, each star your hand has set in place bestows a blessing on the night and all creation sings your praise you formed the moon and fired the sun you quickened us with holy breath and binding us to your dear son renewed our life destroyed our death you walk with us along the way your word a lamp to pilgrim feet. Stay with us now at close of day, our unknown guest, our host and feast. Grant those who share this evening meal the faith and vision to believe, that hearts might see what eyes conceal. By grace your presence we receive. Refreshed by Sabbath, rest this night, awaken us to your shalom. O reign of Christ, unfailing light, where peace and justice are at home. And saints need neither moon nor sun to sing your praise eternally. O merciful, immortal one, O blessed Holy Trinity, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
Amen. The first reading comes from the first chapter of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. The second reading comes from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do also in your hometown the things we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land that Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. 
There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Several times in Luke, including our reading today, Jesus refers to himself as a prophet. Which kind of begs the question, then, what exactly is the role of a prophet? Well, in this case, what we need to do is to go back to the Old Testament and to see what the role of a prophet was back then in the history of of Israel. And when we do that, we will learn that the role of a prophet was not about predicting the future, unless maybe it was to say that the future is secure in God. No, no. The role of a prophet back in the Old Testament was to tell the truth about the present and to give people hope in the presence of God. So, when Jesus reads and reflects on the passage from Isaiah that we heard last week, we hear his reflection again this week, by the way, he is being prophetic. He is pointing out the reality of the world. There are poor people and oppressed people and blind folks who are in need of good news and deliverance and healing. And the reality of the world is that the year of God's favor, the Jubilee, is needed now. I said last week, it is a great message on a great text. And Jesus, again, in a prophetic way, also says, but now is the time for this good news, this year of favor, to happen. What he's saying to the people is, the presence of God is here, now, among you, and among all of those who so desperately need the presence of God in their lives today. Again, great stuff. And remember last week I kind of teased you, how did the people react to that? Here's how. They seem to genuinely like what he's saying. All speak well of him, we are told. They are amazed at his gracious words. That sounds like a successful message to me, doesn't it? And it makes you wonder, why does Jesus turn, well, kind of hostile towards them right after that? What sets him off like that? It's hard to understand, it really is. And I had to wrestle with this a long time this week. But I think it's what the people say after they're amazed at his gracious words and all that. They say, is not this Joseph's son? Sounds harmless enough to us, doesn't it? But apparently not to Jesus. Why? Well, let me be real clear. This is not meant to be put down. You know, they're not saying something like, well, oh, here's that bum Joseph's kid, huh? No, no, they aren't taking that at all. It, it's, it's meant to be a recognition that Jesus is one of them, that he is among his own people, that he is there in his own town. It's, it, it's kind of, well, a compliment, at least from the people's perspective anyway. But Jesus doesn't hear it like that. Jesus hears more in it than that. Because Jesus understands what's really behind that phrase. He understands that by saying Jesus is one of their own, well, that comes with some obligations. See, back then, maybe even today, it was understood that you owed your own folks something. That you needed to take care of your own first. And maybe second. And maybe third, too. So their response kind of becomes, great message, Jesus. We'd love you to give all of that stuff to us. And only to us. See, what Jesus means as good news for all people, the people are hearing it as good news for them and them alone. 
So Jesus says, doubtless you will tell me, doctor, cure yourself, which is a way of saying, yeah, take care of us, because we're you. And he says, you will say to me, do what you did in Capernaum here as well. Now, we have no idea what he was doing in Capernaum. Luke does not tell us at all. But whatever it is, I'm kind of guessing, well, it was probably healings. It was probably, you know, exorcisms of demons or something like that. But what he's being told is, you need to do more than that here in Nazareth. Because we're you, and you're us, and you owe us. Jesus isn't going to have any of that. So he reminds the folks about prophets past. And he turns to two of the big ones. He turns to Elijah and Elisha. And he reminds the folks about how they both brought miraculous blessings to foreigners and not to Israelites. The widow of Zarephath in Sidon was fed during the famine. Naaman, the Syrian general, was cured of his leprosy. Not the Israelite lepers. And the painful part of that for the folks there is they know that. Because it's all there in Scripture. See, what, the thing that Jesus is trying to get across, friends, is that good news, especially the good news Jesus is fulfilling today and they're hearing is for all people. He is not the local miracle worker. He is not theirs. He is everyone's. God's blessings, God's healings, God's deliverance, God's favor is for all people, regardless of who they are or where they are or what they do or what they have done. It is there for all people, the ones you like and the ones you don't like. The ones you would welcome with open arms, the ones you wouldn't ever welcome at all. The ones you love, also the ones you don't want to love. Jesus did not come to proclaim good news just for Nazareth, and they don't get a special claim on him, and by extension, you know, we don't get a special claim on Jesus either. Jesus is not simply our Savior. Jesus does not work for us. He's not under any special obligation to us. Jesus came to love and save, heal and renew, restore and forgive, welcome and embrace everyone. And he calls us to do the same thing. The year of God's favor, the year of jubilee is for all people. The Spirit of God is sent to all people. The good news is to be proclaimed to all people. All people are to be welcomed in, treated with love and respect and courtesy and decency. All people are blessed. All people are wonderfully made. All people are beautiful and special and deserving of unconditional love. All people. And that can be hard to hear. I get it. I mean, sometimes it's hard for me to hear, too. Because all people is so, well, it's so inclusive. And we just find it hard to be that inclusive. I know. I struggle with it, too. God knows. We're not going to get it right all the time. We're going to stumble and fall short sometimes. And we know that, too. God knows that too. But the good news is that God never gives up on us or on anyone. No matter how often you fail or stumble, God is still there, filled with forgiving and renewing love. No matter what you've done or not done, it doesn't stop God's love from reaching out for you and embracing you and calling you in and making you new again and again and again. It's good today that we read that very, very famous passage from 1 Corinthians about love. Because that's a high standard, folks. And the reason it's a high standard is because that's God's standard. And we won't always live, be able to live up to that one. Or maybe love up to that standard. 
that might be a better way to put it, huh? But again, the good news is, while we can't live up to that, God does. When our love isn't patient and kind, God's love still is. When our love is envious and boastful and rude, God's love is not. When we rejoice in wrongdoing, God forgives it. When we insist on our own way, God comes to show us God's way. When our love falls short, God's love stands tall. When our love fails, God's love remains perfect. The reason love never ends is because God is love and God never ends. God's love never ends, no matter how hard we might try to make it end. Folks, love is what binds us together. Love is how God binds us together. Love is why we proclaim good news and hope and deliverance. Not because we can make it happen all the time, but because God can. And because God will make it happen all the time for all the people. In God's time, not ours. God is always present and active in us, with us, and for us. But it's not just us. It's for all people everywhere. And that's a prophetic word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I invite you to join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
watch, O oh Lord, with all those who weep. Give your angels and saints charge over all who sleep. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. For we trust in your mercy, made real to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you all and also with you. Please take a moment now to share God's peace with those whom you are worshiping with this evening. Once again, folks, thank you all for being with us. We certainly thank you for your patience as we wind our way through um, another phase of COVID. We thank you for your prayers and for your words of support that you send to us. We thank you if you are able to support us financially in continuing our ministry here at St. Matthew. If you are able to support us financially, please do so. You may go to our website and make a donation there. You may certainly send us a donation through the post office. However you choose to support our ministry, we are grateful beyond words. We are blessed by your love, and we pray that in some small way you are being blessed by our ministry as well. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you, O God, gracious and merciful. You bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger that all may know your care. Prepare us now to feast upon your mercy, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the forgive remembrance of me. Gathered around the table by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please take a moment now, wherever you are worshiping, to take the bread and the cracker, the wine and the grape juice, and join with me in sharing the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Let us pray. Creator of the stars of night, we give you thanks for this gift of life. Increase our faith and open our eyes that we might recognize Jesus and all whom you call us to love and serve. Abide with us as darkness deepens and be our hope and highest joy until at last with all your saints we dwell in your unfailing light. Amen. Holy God, blessed Trinity, strengthen your faith, increase your hope, deepen your love, and give you peace this night and always. Amen. Go in peace, rest in God, rise to serve. Thanks be to God. Once again, folks, thank you all for being with us. Be well, be safe, have a great week in the Lord, and we will see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye, everybody.